So we're now in this point three, the precepts for training in those practices. And the six perfections are in verses 25 to 30. And then 30 to 30, 31 to 37 are just kind of like a summary of everything that came before. So we may or may not have time to get to those, but it's variations on a theme. So when we get into the six transcendent perfections or the far reaching attitudes or the paramitas, these are all synonyms. They are transcendent generosity, transcendent discipline or ethics or morality, transcendent patience or forbearance, transcendent diligence, sometimes called joyous effort or enthusiasm, transcendent concentration and transcendent wisdom. So these six perfections are basically the attitudes and activities of a bodhisattva. So you've kind of tick listed your intention and tick listed your application. And now these are like the promises you make as an aspiring bodhisattva, or once you actually are a bodhisattva, these are then in their fully perfected form. And it's kind of like, it's good common sense and a good way to live generally, but it's also really powerful to think all of these good things that you kind of probably thought were a good idea anyway, what if we were to do them under the influence of bodhicitta. So here's the verses. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to give out of generosity with no hopes of karmic recompense or expectation of reward. For if those who seek awakening must give even their own bodies, what need is there to mention mere outer objects and possessions? And so we're remembering that generosity is the intention to give and that the four types of generosity are giving dharma, giving loving kindness, giving freedom from fear, and then material generosity. But here what it's talking about is despite the fact that if you give, you're creating the cause for resources and support, you want to give without thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, without hopes of the karmic recompense or the expectation of reward. So despite the fact that you'll get that, don't think of that while you're giving because then it sort of becomes contaminated with self-interest. And so then those who seek awakening, meaning bodhisattvas, give even their own bodies like the story of the Buddha in one of his previous lives, giving his body to the hungry tigress so that she wouldn't eat her cubs in the Golden Light Sutra, some of you know. Um, we can't do that yet, but we're aspiring to be at that level. So what need is there to mention of mere outer objects and possessions? And so this is the mentality we have is, you know, these things are things, if they're useful for others, it's almost as if I already gave them to them. You know, a little bit like um, if a mother has a child in her lap and she's eating, I don't know, string cheese and the baby takes it and starts eating it. She's just like, yeah, of course, because it's assumed that everything that the mother has is for the baby, too. Yeah, um, there's not like the thing that happens with children if one takes from another and then they're like, grr, and they have a fight. No, you know, it's sort of this elevated generosity that's like, well, I already kind of gave it to you. So the fact that you're taking it, of course. And in no way is this an invitation to martyrdom or to be a doormat or to be taken advantage of. This is a position of great strength where you feel in, so empowered that you're no longer trapped by your objects. You know, your, your possessions no longer own you. And so you have that kind of free mind that's like, sure, you know, take it, borrow it, whatever. But it's not, um, it's not hooked by the idea of ownership. Does that make sense, that generosity one? Do you feel any worries or, or qualms? You know, intellectually, I'm sure you understand quite easily. In terms of experience, at what point do you say, that's too much, I'm not giving anymore? And is that from a place of wisdom and healthy boundaries, or is that from a place of deprivation mentality and selfishness? You know, and, and only we know that, but that's the question to just sit with right now is, whatever my limit is, whether it's a limit on my time and energy, 
whether it's a limit on my affection, a limit on my actual giving of, of possessions or money, when I hit that ceiling of that's all I got, we're done now. Is it a healthy boundary that's making a correct assessment of the resources you actually have? Or is it selfishness going, nope, <laughs> you know? So just kind of sit with what is your, what's your line? <laughs> yeah, just reflectively. When is it too much? Because what happens is if you give more than you can, is then you're resentful at the very thing you gave to or the person you gave to. You say, I agreed to this much and you took this much and now I'm mad at you even though I said I would give it. <laughs> or I said I would give it, but you took more than I offered and now I'm mad at you and I'm mad at myself for even opening the door to it. You know, and all this sort of stuff happens. And, you know, it's very... <laughs> It's very interesting to do this from two perspectives, one from the perspective of you, the giver, but on the other hand, when people offer to you, how much are they actually offering? Because we all have this kind of, well, all of us, but all of us who are like, quote, on a spiritual path, we have an identity of being a kind and generous person, but often we offer what we feel able to on our best day, as opposed to what's actually sustainable. So, you know, if you ever worked for a nonprofit, they always are saying, give until it hurts, you know. But in Buddhism, we would say, if you feel like you could offer $100 to support our Dharma Center, give us 80. Because then you'll be, a, then you'll be really happy giving 80 and want to give again and create a habit of giving, which will have ripple effects in this and future lives, which is a great attitude to have. But if you give what you think is your outer limit, it's probably overestimating what you actually will be comfortable with. And you'll give 100 and then never give again. You're like, that's all I had. I did my duty. Tick. Stop bugging me. You know? So when people are offering something to us or when we're asking something of them, it's very skillful to take less than they offered because often people overestimate what they're capable of doing sustainably because they have this identity of being a good person. Do you know what I mean? Like maybe your neighbor said, come and take my rosemary. I always have too much rosemary in my garden. Take as much as you want. And then one time you took more than usual and they were like, uh, I can't say you can't because I already told you you could, but oh no, that was too much, you know? People overestimate their abilities. So it's kind of like from the side of the receiver, know that. <laughs> from you, the side of the giver, you're trying to expand yours. Does it make sense? Yeah, it's just good common sense, but it's just a good knowing to remember because people often think that they're better at things than they are because they are occasionally that good at them. Um, and, you know, jump in if you have an additional thought or a question with these, but I'll just keep going. Um, the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to observe ethical restraint without the slightest intention of continuing samsaric existence. For lacking discipline, one will never secure even one's own well-being. And so any thought of bringing benefit to others would be absurd. So what it's really saying is that if you don't take care of actions and their effects, you're never gonna get out of samsara. And if you're not out of samsara, you can't help anyone else get out of samsara. And so to think that ethics don't apply to you because you mean well generally is a kind of a self-deception we wanna be careful about. You know, maybe we have a tiny form of, I don't know, maybe generally we think recycling Aluminum is really important and I and we should always recycle aluminum and then at work you notice they don't recycle it and you think you guys this is terrible let's get a can at the workplace so that we always recycle our aluminum but then at your own house you're like yeah anyway I mean well I'll do it sometimes. You know, so it's like, it's kind of really just noticing, are we practicing what we preach? Are we walking the walk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and really remembering that to get out of samsara, you need a very stable mind that's able to concentrate and focus. Without ethics, the mind is very agitated with justification as well as craving. So ethics and focus have a very strong relationship and you can't really precisely get the antidotes you need unless you have a focused mind. So your ethics help you sleep at night, but your ethics also help you with stability. 
thoughts on ethics. <laughs> ethics in Buddhism is restraint from harm. Ethics is just restraint from harm. So when you don't restrain from harm, your mind is very agitated. Do you agree? Just experientially, if you've done the wrong thing and you know it was the wrong thing, there's a whole dance in your mind of disassociating, justification, excuses, avoidance. There's a whole thing. Yeah, and then to try and focus on something virtuous, it starts eating your mental peace. Um, so of course it's not great in the long run and it's not great for relationships, but it's also not good just for your practice. Um, makes sense. So then we have patience, which um, is, is tricky because of course, when we're talking about anger is never justified, we always mean the wish to harm is never justified, meaning it's irrational. Of course, it's not useful. Of course, it's harmful. But we also are looking at the fact that it's irrational. It's not based in logic. So the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to cultivate patience, free from any trace of animosity toward anyone at all. Since any potential source of harm is like a priceless treasure to the bodhisattva who is eager to enjoy the wealth of virtue. So this is similar to the eight verses, isn't it? When you're seeing um, difficult people is very, very valuable. And um, indeed they are. I think that one we've, we've talked about in other ways, um, but does anyone have questions about that one? Patience in Buddhism is forbearance with suffering. Yeah, go ahead, Jackie. I, these are built one upon another, eh? So I was a little surprised that patience isn't first, because I see it as sort of the basis of all non-harm, and that space is what gives you the strength for the ethics, et cetera. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, I think, think about it experientially, like if you were teaching a little kid, you could teach a little kid to share probably before you could teach them how to be patient. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, and you could sort of teach them not to hit their brother, but they're not necessarily going to feel love and affection for them. They might just be trained not to hit them, you know, so they can get a bit of ethics, but they still don't have patience yet. Once they have patience, then we can start really opening up the kind of more evolved states of mind. Now for a bodhisattva, all six perfections are contained within each individual perfection. So for a bodhisattva, they have, of course, the bodhicitta motivation uncontrived, but when they're practicing generosity, they're practicing the patience of generosity and the ethics of generosity and the joyous effort of generosity and the concentration of generosity and the wisdom of generosity with their generosity, you know? Right, so like fully formed, we want everything to be like an integrated effort, but in terms of like introductory development, they go one by one by one. You know, so you give and you think, I have to give ethically something I actually <laughs> am allowed to give. You know, I'm not going to take the flowers from a neighbor's garden and give them. I'm going to take the flowers from my own garden and give them. And I'm going to give them with patience because the response might not be good. I give them to someone and they sneeze and then I'm sad. So I need to give with patience, you know, and then I need to give with joyous effort that isn't content with just giving once, but wants to do it again and again. And you do it in a focused way, a concentrated way that notices the, res the response, notices everything in terms of sort of social niceties and politeness. And then with the wisdom that realizes you were only able to give because of countless causes and conditions, they were only able to receive because of countless causes and conditions. And the substance you gave only existed because of countless causes and conditions, as well as everybody's responses to it. And so then you don't get hooked into thinking, I was a good person for doing that. You know, you don't get like fundamentalist about it. And then you do that with each of the perfections. Does it make sense? Right? So that's like advanced, um, advanced practice. But yeah, in the beginning, they go sequentially. And then in the end, they all go together. Um, but of course, you know, you can practice them out of order if you want to. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, I, I always go wrong in my um, concept of what patience is, because it is a state of mind. And I just see it as being a restraint. You know, right. a restraint, and that's where I went wrong. And thank you. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, no, it sounds like um, uh, maybe what you were calling patience is what we call ethics. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And, you know, and it comes first. And then patience is there is actually something painful to work with. You know, ethics exists whether things are good or whether things are bad or whether things are neutral. Whereas patience is like elevated practice because think something needs to be causing you suffering, either physical, mental suffering or relational suffering or difficulties in practicing your spiritual path. And so it's, yeah. it's, it's epic. <laughs> Yeah. That section, it's, it's my favorite section in the long run, the patient section, because it just so thoroughly dispels all of the reasons why we justify our anger. It just breaks them apart and you just start laughing at yourself because you just see yourself in all the lines. You're like, oh my gosh, I've totally said that to myself. So anyway, if you're ever wanting a good laugh at your own expense, read the patient section of the long run chen <laughs> Okay, so then we get into joyous effort, which is sometimes translated as enthusiastic diligence, or just diligence, which sounds awful, um, or enthusiasm, which sounds very American. Um, but anyway, I like joyous effort, but they're calling it enthusiastic diligence in this translation. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to strive with enthusiastic diligence, the source of all good qualities when working for the sake of all who live seeing that even Shravikas and Pratyeka Buddhas who labor for themselves alone, exert themselves as if urgently trying to extinguish fires upon their heads. So Shravikas and Pratyeka Buddhas, um, these are hearers and solitary realizers who are practitioners of um, the initial vehicle or the Theravadan tradition. And they're seeking Nirvana alone, right? Mere liberation the state beyond sorrow. They're not seeking to become Buddhas for the welfare of all sentient beings, though they will achieve that at some point. Um, but just for their own sake, they practice as if their heads are on fire. That's how, that's how much energy they put into their practice. And so it's saying if they work that hard and they're just working for their own liberation, how much more joy and energy and momentum do we need if we're on the Bodhisattva path? So, in, in Buddhism, joyous effort is called delight in virtue, which is like kind of plastic sounding. It's a little sugary, but what, what they really mean is that you love what you're doing. And that kind of is self-perpetuating energy. You love doing things that are positive and are of benefit to others. And so whenever you're stopping that, it's just to rest up so you can keep doing it. Yeah. And so you pace yourself because you love it so much, you know, and you have a marathon mentality that loves the scenery the whole way. Um, so joyous effort is really about burnout prevention or relief. It's, um, it's all of the teachings in Buddhism about preventing burnout or saving yourself from burnout or relieving yourself if it's too late. It's really about pacing and the way to think about the path so that you don't burn yourself out or kind of get disillusioned or, you know, push too hard and give it up altogether. So it's a really important section, but uh, delight in virtue is <laughs> sort of a funny way of framing it, but that's the traditional framing. It just means loving to do positive work. And then concentration, the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to cultivate concentration which utterly transcends the four formless absorptions in the knowledge that mental afflictions are overcome entirely through penetrating insight infused with stable calm. So the four formless absorptions are levels of concentrated awareness that are more, more elevated than the desire realm, which is where our mind is right now. The form and formless realms, you need calm abiding in order to access those kind of transcendent mindsets. And they're very blissful. And you know, you really are in a peaceful, happy state when your um, mind has achieved a form or formless absorption or concentration. But what we need as bodhisattva practitioners is that stability and that bliss combined with insight. And then, so that leads right into wisdom and the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to cultivate wisdom beyond the three conceptual spheres, meaning agent, action, object, along with skillful means, 
since it is not possible to attain the perfect level of awakening through the other five paramitas alone in wisdom's absence. So it's basically saying all the other perfections, paramitas, far-reaching attitudes, the rest of them are very, very important on the method side of the path, but they're not going to really go anywhere unless they have the eyes of wisdom. So it's kind of like they're all of the other parts of the body, but without eyes, you don't know where you're going. So it, wisdom is like the eyes. So those are the six perfections. And that's kind of what I wanted to leave you guys with. The rest of the verses are just like, remember what happened before, do that. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful text. So I hope you come back to it again and again. And um, in terms of your follow-up practice, um, what I would do is I would pick one verse and just keep coming back to that verse, maybe once a day in the morning as your motivation for maybe a month or two and just kind of be with it as kind of the guiding light in your life for a while. And when it feels like you've made friends with it and it's kind of got a home in your heart, you know, and this is all sounding very cheesy, I apologize. But when it has that sense, then you could shift to another verse. Um, but I think that that's a really good way to kind of bring a text like this into your daily life without like overwhelming yourself. Just pick one as your project. Um, I have a friend who cycles through just the six perfection verses, just those ones. And she just does generosity for a while and then she shifts and then she shifts. And then when she gets to wisdom, she goes back to generosity mm -hmm. and just, that's a good way to kind of orient her life. So um, that's recommended follow-up practice and the recommended reading list um, hopefully will get forwarded to you guys. Um, so I appreciate it. You guys um, taking the time this weekend to do this text. It was, it was fun and a, a fun way to kind of meet everybody. So um, we'll just dedicate. <laughs> May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Venerable Yenten, I was asked by Catherine to uh, do a virtual kata to you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And then from, from a number of the participants have been direct messaging me, do not forget to request to ask her to please come back and teach at Lama Yeshe House. So, so I would like to do that. This has just been tremendous and, and, a, and a reminder that of all the existential challenges, we, we have these bright spots like being able to to receive teachings from you. Um, so thank you so much for making time for us. It's just been tremendous. Oh, you're very welcome. And it, it was nice to be in the Rocky Mountains and teach to my same time zone for once as well. So that was nice. 